This is a picture test in practical anatomy of the upper limb. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the shoulder region and axilla. A baseball player felt a tearing pain in his shoulder while strongly pitching. Which of the muscle tendons A to D is most likely damaged? Muscle A is the deltoid muscle, which has been dissected and reflected away from its proximal bony attachments. The other muscles are of the rotator cuff group. B is teres minor, C is infraspinatus, and D is supraspinatus. Lesions of the cuff are a common cause of pain in the shoulder region. During abduction, supraspinatus initiates abduction. Its tendon passes beneath the coracoacromial ligament in its way to be inserted into the superior facet on the greater tubercle of the humerus. Thus, this tendon of supraspinatus is exposed to friction against the acromion process and the coracoacromial arch. Normally, the friction is reduced by the presence of a bursa, which is a synovial pad that is located where tendons rub against bone to reduce friction. The bursa here is called the subacromial bursa. It extends laterally beneath the deltoid as well, hence its name is the subdeltoid bursa. Degenerative changes in the bursa are followed by degenerative changes in supraspinatus tendon and other tendons of the rotator cuff, but mainly supraspinatus tendon. And this is what is called subacromial bursitis and supraspinatus tendinitis, resulting in pain and rupture of the tendon. So the tendon that is most likely damaged here is the supraspinatus tendon D. In life, which fascia extends at this gap, indicated by the star? List two structures passing through it. The fascia is the clavipectoral fascia, and it's a sheet of deep fascia filling the space between the clavicle and pectoralis minor, hence the name clavipectoral fascia. The fascia splits twice. Above, it encloses subclavius muscle, just below the clavicle, and below it encloses the pectoralis minor muscle. So it is splitting here, unites, splits again, and then it unites to form what we call the suspensory ligament of the axilla that is attached to the skin of the floor of the axilla and is responsible for maintaining the axillary hollow. Four structures pass through the clavipectoral fascia. Two of them pass inwards, and two of them pass outwards. Passing inwards are lymphatic vessels from the infraclavicular lymph nodes to the apical group of axillary lymph nodes, as well as the cephalic vein draining into the axillary vein. Passing outwards are the acromiothoracic artery or axis, which is a branch of the second part of the axillary artery behind pectoralis minor, and the other structure is the lateral pectoral nerve branch of the lateral cord of the brachial plexus that supplies both pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. A wrestler is examined following shoulder injury during a match. Radiological study is shown. On further examination, there is loss of sensation of the skin over the lower half of deltoid muscle. Which of the nerves A to C is most likely injured? It is clear from the radiograph that there is a dislocation of the shoulder joint that might stretch and injure the axillary nerve lying just beneath the joint. Now let's look at the dissection and try to find the axillary nerve among the other branches of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. This is the posterior cord. The posterior cord has five branches, the upper subscapular, and then the lower subscapular, 
and in between them is the thoracodorsal nerve we can follow it and find that it goes to the tendon of latissimus dorsi muscle and then the other two branches of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus are terminal branches large branches and these are the axillary nerve B and the radial nerve A you can see the radial nerve passes straight forwards to reach the arm while the axillary nerve it disappears by leaving the axilla through the quadriangular space passing beneath the shoulder joint so B is the axillary nerve the axillary nerve is probably inappropriately named since it supplies nothing in the axilla the first thing it does is to quit the axilla as it is seen here by passing through the quadriangular space just below the capsule of the shoulder joint and around the surgical neck of the humerus the axillary nerve is thus liable to injury in fractures of the surgical neck and dislocation of the shoulder joint identify the structures a to c what is the origin of each of the identified artery and nerve now let's be oriented this is a view from the back of the scapula here is the medial border of the scapula and that is the scapular spine dividing the posterior surface of the scapula into supraspinous and infraspinous fossa the muscle that is reflected here dissected and reflected up is the trapezius muscle with some accessory nerve branches underneath it when trapezius is reflected up supraspinatus muscle is exposed deep to it in the supraspinous fossa and it is here divided into two halves and the two halves are separated away from each other showing the upper border of the scapula so this is the region of the upper border of the scapula where we are dealing with the structures under question at the region of the suprascapular notch the suprascapular notch is bridged by a ligament the suprascapular ligament thus converting the notch into a foramen a is the suprascapular ligament passing above the suprascapular ligament is the suprascapular artery of course vessels artery and vein while the suprascapular nerve passes beneath the ligament so c is the suprascapular artery and b which passes underneath the ligament is the suprascapular nerve the suprascapular artery resembles arteries elsewhere in the body in avoiding to pass through tight compartments that's it passes superior to the ligament remember the situation of the median nerve passing underneath the flexor retinaculum within the carpal tunnel while the radial and ulnar arteries do not pass through the tight tunnel the suprascapular artery is a branch of the first part of the subclavian artery and it participates in the scapular anastomosis while the suprascapular nerve is a branch of the upper trunk of the brachial plexus it supplies both supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles all the labeled muscles are supplied by branches of the brachial plexus except so let's identify the muscles a is trapezius muscle b is the deltoid c is infraspinatus d rhomboid major muscle e is latissimus dorsi latissimus dorsi is supplied by the thoracodorsal nerve from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus rhomboid is supplied by the dorsal scapular nerve from the roots of the brachial plexus c infraspinatus is supplied by the suprascapular nerve from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus b is deltoid which is supplied by the axillary nerve from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus so all these muscles are supplied by the brachial plexus except a trapezius which is supplied by the accessory nerve the 11th cranial nerve and the nerve can be seen on the deep side of the upper part of the muscle injury of which nerves a to c is most likely responsible for the deformity shown in the picture the deformity shown here results from an upper brachial plexus injury that follows excessive displacement of the head to the opposite side and depression of the shoulder 
on the same side. And this might occur in this infant because of difficult labor. And this results in traction, stretching, and tearing of C5 and 6 roots. In adults, similar injury might follow a blow or a fall on the shoulder, especially from a motorcycle accident, resulting in separation of the head and shoulder and stretching the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. You can see here a dissection of the roots of the brachial plexus, roots, trunks of the brachial plexus, the supraclavicular portion of the brachial plexus. You can see the roots from C5 to T1, and C5, 6 roots form the upper trunk, C7 forms the middle trunk, C8 and T1 form the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, and these roots are located in between scalenus anterior and scalenus medius muscles and the posterior triangle of the neck. You will remember that the suprascapular nerve arises from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. Other nerves containing fibers derived from C5 and C6 are also affected, such as nerve to subclavius, which is not that important, but the important nerves are the musculocutaneous and axillary nerves. Therefore, the position of the limb will be characteristic. It may hang by the side, adducted and medially rotated by the unopposed pectoralis major muscle. Adducted, as you can see, and medially rotated. The forearm will be extended and pronated because the action of biceps is lost. Biceps is supplied by musculocutaneous nerve, which is affected here. Axillary nerve that is affected will affect abduction, thus the uh, limb is adducted at the shoulder. So mainly shoulder abduction, flexion, and supination of the forearm are lost. The position of the upper limb is likened to that of a porter or waiter indicating their desire for a tip. So it is also called waiter's tip position. Upper lesions of the brachial plexus are also called herb duchenne palsy. In addition to the loss of motor function, there might be an area of loss of sensation on the lateral side of the arm and forearm, especially if both C5 and 6 are affected. Identify the muscles A and B, what is the nerve supply of each, what is the action of each muscle on the shoulder joint. The muscle A is infraspinatus. It is seen here below the spine of the scapula, arising from the infraspinous fossa. And if we follow the tendon, you can see that the tendon passes behind the shoulder joint to be attached to the middle facet on the greater tubercle of the humerus. Thus, it's an obvious lateral rotator of the humerus, and it is part of the rotator cuff group of muscles. It is supplied by the suprascapular nerve, which passes here, the supraspinous fossa supplying supraspinatus, and then comes into the infraspinous fossa, to supply the infraspinatus. The muscle B is teres major muscle. This muscle arises from the dorsal surface of the inferior angle and lateral border of the scapula, as you can see it here. This is a, this is a big muscle here, bulky muscle. And it is supplied by the lower subscapular nerve from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. Lower subscapular also supplies subscapularis. Teres major is an adductor and extensor of the humerus at the shoulder joint. And this is because, as we can see here, teres major passes to the front of the humerus, where it is inserted into the medial lip of the intertubercular groove of the humerus. But teres minor, the smaller muscle here, that arises just above teres major, remains in the back as it is attached to the lower facet on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The greater tubercle of the humerus has three facets. The uppermost one is for the attachment of supraspinatus, and the middle one is for the attachment of infraspinatus. The lower one is attachment for teres minor.